So we're going to continue with the musculoskeletal system here, looking at skeletal muscle and mus muscle tissue properties as it relates to the functional anatomy of the body. So let's start with some special characteristics that we'll see with skeletal muscle. So each muscle fiber runs the entire length of the muscle fascicle and is a single long cylindrical muscle cell. That muscle cell is broken up into distinct regions. The muscle cell itself is polynucleated, which means that it is going to have multiple nuclei. This multiple nuclei is going to divide up the cell itself into distinct regions. Those distinct regions are referred to as myonuclear domains. The muscle cell itself does not divide. It's amitotic. However, when it is stressed and when it needs to generate more contractile strength, it will activate satellite cells that are dormant stem cells. Those satellite cells will integrate themselves into the sarcolemma, the cell membrane, and then allow for the cell itself to grow larger because there is now an additional myonuclear domain within the cell itself. Now what's interesting is that the myonuclear domains will have a stable ratio in terms of the diameter of the fiber to the number of myonuclear domains for that fiber. Those myonuclear domains in terms of that ratio will stay consistent, which means that as the cell gets larger, we keep those myonuclear domains ratio stable. So we'll start adding myonuclear domains in order to match the diameter fiber. If the muscle is lost due to atrophy, the myonuclear domains will stay unless the fiber itself becomes too small, at which point in time we actually lose the myonuclear domains and the muscle cell will not be able to grow after that. We change some of the nomenclature here and we call stuff sarcos. So the sarcolemma is going to be the cell membrane. The sarcoplasm is going to be the cytoplasm. Just beneath the sarcolemma, within the sarcoplasm, there will be a host of mitochondria and the nuclei. The majority of the sarcoplasm itself is entirely proteins what we refer to as myofibrils. The principal myofibrils that we see are actinomycin, titan, dystrophin, elastin, collagen, and then regulatory proteins such as troponin and tropomyosin. Skeletal muscle has a couple of key functions for us as it relates to homeostasis. Number one is it's going to allow for gross motor actions and fine motor actions and allow us to have postural stability. Gross actions is where we have the full kinematic chain moving, such as raising your hand to ask a question, throwing a ball, kicking a ball. Those are all gross actions because the whole entire kinematic chain is moving. Fine motor actions is where just one segment of the kinematic chain will be moving and we usually associate those fine motions with distal ends of the kinematic chain. So writing is a fine motor action. Now when it comes to recruitment of this, we actually recruit more muscle to do a fine motor action than we do to a gross motor action. But the muscle mass that gets recruited is much larger on the gross motor action than it is on the fine motor action. The other thing that we're going to get is a large amount of heat. Most of the body heat that we have is coming from the skeletal muscles, either from energy transformation processes, loss of energy in the thermodynamic principles of ATP regeneration, or from the frictional heat exchange due to protein-protein interaction allowing for contractions to take place. When we talk about the functional part of the skeletal muscle, what we have to remember here is that structure of the muscle is going to match its function and the function of the muscle is going to match its structure. So we can determine what type of contraction we can get based off of the fiber types. We can determine what pattern of 
motor action we can get based off of the arrangement of the muscle itself in what's referred to as the pination patterning. And we can measure how the force within the contraction leading to the tensile strength leading to the motion within the muscle comes about strictly off of the arrangements within the muscle itself. Muscles can only pull in the direction that they are attached to. If we know origin and insertion of a muscle, we can automatically determine what action that muscle can do. If we know what type of fiber is being recruited, we can determine how much strength, how much work, and what power can come about from the recruitment. So we'll start with the muscle large. In the muscle large, we start with the muscle building in, building down into the fascicle, the fascicle being, being built down into the fibers, the fibers being built down into the fibrils, and the fibrils being built down into the myofilaments. This is a build up, build down, contiguous connection point. The muscle itself is connected to the bones via tendons or attachments within the muscle itself there are distinct forms of connective tissue the most central connective tissue is the endomyosome which is going to be surrounding the individual fibers the paramyosome which will be surrounding the individual fascicles, the epimysome, which will be surrounding the entirety of the muscle itself. Each one of these mysomes are going to run into each other so as to form a continuous connection of connective tissue. The connective tissue we see is going to be principally collagen and elastin in terms of their protein matrix. In terms of the attachments, we have two references that we give based off of how the kinemax of motion is occurring. The origin of the muscle is the end that does not move during contraction. The insertion of the muscle is the end that does move. Now, in textbooks, there's a lot of times given a reference of origin and insertion. The problem is, is that this is going to flip based off of is it an open chain motion or is it a closed chain motion? And so you can always just simply indicate the attachment as opposed to origin and insertion, because the origin and insertion will be flipping based off of the kinemax of movement. Now, these attachments have distinct names and nomenclatures based off of how the connective tissues are connecting with each other. Tendons. We get a dense connective tissue that will indirectly attach the muscle to the bone. So what ends up happening is that with the tendon, it's going to come away from the epimysum through the fascial plane and attach to the paraosteum of the bone. Tendons usually tend to be long in nature relative to the other two types of attachments. The other types of attachments are the aponeurosa. The aponeurosa is where the connective tissue that is going to form the attachment site is going to include the epimysum and the paramysum within it. It is elongated relative to the direct attachment. In the direct attachment, we cannot actually indicate a tendon. What we see is we see epimysum directly integrating into paraosteum of the bone. In the connective tissues that we see, we have two principal proteins. We will see elastin and we will see collagen. Elastin increases the elasticity of the connective tissue. It allows it for stretching. Collagen increases the rigidity of the attachment and keeps it from stretching. In a normal tendon, we have a greater ratio of elastin to collagen than what we see within ligaments. The more the muscle is used, the more collagen gets put into the tendon, and the more that tendon will start to function as an aponeurosa. The reason for this is because we want the muscle to stretch slightly within its kinematic patterning. However, we don't want it to stretch so much that we lose any type of mechanical advantage that we can get from the muscle itself. 
Now, in terms of this connective tissue patterning, we have what's referenced as the myosome layers. And the myosome layers are going to connect in such a way that we have fibers. And these fibers are going to run, the sarcolemma is going to run contiguous with the endomyosome. The endomyosome is going to run contiguous with the paramyosome. The paramyosome is going to run contiguous with the epimyosome as we start to cluster these fibers together, very similar to building up rope fibers. What we have to remember here is that each component of the connective tissue is going to impart a distinct function within the muscle in which the belly of the muscle is the gaster and this is the central portion. This central portion is what gets divided into the pination patterning that we see based off of the connective tissue leading to what's referred to as banding patterns. And the banding patterns exist in such a way that we get serial patterning. Serial patterning is going to cut across the connective tissue and make stop bridges within the connective tissue. This is principally collagen. And then parallel patterning. Parallel patterning is going to run parallel to the connective tissue and it's going to allow for elongation. And this is principally going to be made of elastin. Now, this elastin is going to allow for a pre-stretch of the muscle to allow for increased return of potential energy. Now, the other thing that happens because of the way in which the fascicles arrange themselves within this connective tissue patterning is what we develop a pination pattern. This is how do the, do the fascicles arrange themselves around the central line of the muscle within the gaster. The angle of the connective tissue to the long axis is going to dictate the contractile tensile strength capacity, the strength of the muscle, due to the summations of the lines of pull that we get from the various fascicles based off of the concept of lines of pull. The lines of pull is the resultant direction force relative to the axis of rotation. And so what we do is we look at how does the angles interact. So I have a vertical and I have a horizontal angle of pull, an x and a y axis direction, in order to cause motion rotation at the pivot point of the articulation. The resultant line of pull is the combination of those two distinct vectors within the muscle in which we get the sum of forces within the muscle providing the motion that is necessary. We can look at these distinct pination patterns and get what's referred to as a reference angle within the tendon. The reference angle within the tendon is going to dictate how much force and thereby how much strength can I get out of the muscle. And what this does is we want to have angles that provide both a sine function and a cosine function within the summative forces. And so what this does is this is going to modify how we have adaptations within the muscle fiber and why we see instead of getting more muscle fibers, we get larger muscle fibers. Because what ends up happening is that if I start adding more fibers, I get a steeper angle of pull and I will very quickly lose out on the sine and the cosine additive factors within the summations of forces. Whereas if I get longer fibers, a greater cross-sectional area, I still have my 
unique reference angle that I had before, which means that I keep my summative sine and cosine forces within this, in which what we have to remember is that the sine and cosine at 90 degrees are going to negate each other. within the contraction patterning so that what I want to do is I want to grow the muscle, making it broader, increasing the length of the fiber, as opposed to increasing the number of fibers, keeping the length stable. We will talk more about this when we look at adaptations 